Bonjour. Hier, on a parlé français toute la journée, donc je pense que je vais faire pareil. Good morning. Um, I am quite amazed to see. It's great to see all you. It's, it's amazing that Lean is still interesting and attractive to so many people, so welcome. Uh, just so I get some sense of who you are, who's new to Lean? Two years, two years lean, five, five, all right, ten, hey, get, get a life guys, I mean, come on, fifteen, yeah, <laughs> well after yesterday, what have you been doing all this time, <laughs> okay, right, so, uh, I will be uh, probably challenging your idea what lean is, I, I, there are really two points I want to get across. But again, as we discussed yesterday, I want you to take a deep breath, open your chakras, and ask yourself, you, you, nobody comes to Lean Conference by accident. So what is it that you come looking for here? But as we discussed yesterday, not, not for others, not for your company, but for yourself. It, it, it's been a very interesting journey. Um, Basically, there are many debates, lean, beyond lean, what is lean, all these things. Lean to me is very simple. Toyota showed us, Toyota challenged us with a, another way of doing business. And this challenge is very simple. How can we increase value while generating less waste? And really, lean is our response, your response. We need to understand what Toyota did, does, because we need to understand what it, me what, what it means in each of your contexts. And it's sometimes difficult to understand what Toyota does. Uh, I fell into Lean completely by accident because my father had discovered Toyota back in 1975 when he was a car executive. And when he became the technical VP of a big supplier, he started working with them. I was doing my PhD on uh, social sciences and knowledge sciences at the time. So I was looking for a case to study. So he said, uh, why, don't you do, why don't you get a real job? I said, well, thanks, Dad. And I said, but if you want to we're doing this thing in the factory. And say, in the factory? Me? Are, are you kidding? But, but then I went. And here I saw Toyota do with the supplier. This is the very first action plan that we have. So Toyota comes in and says, listen, although the truck is only, we ramp up. So the truck is only leaving once a week. We want you to have a guy pick up on this cell every two hours. What? Then he said, although we have these big batches, these big containers to do big batches, we want to throw them away and take a little plastic container with only five parts. You pay for them. Plant manager said, what? Then the batches, rather than do right, life right, right and left, and the batches we want to do to reduce this to just five containers of five parts. And you know what? Oh, hey. Don't touch the fucking cameras. Just don't touch the cameras. Don't touch. Don't screw with the cameras. Say, what? And that's all the, all the difficulties you're going to have. We want operators to write them on the board. And all we're going to do is solve them one by one. So the plant manager kicked them out of the plant. Say, I have bet that, yeah, I don't have time for this shit. I have better things to do with my time. And he get a phone call from my father. Said, you know, Toyota, you, Toyota, you. Guess who's going to go first? OK. So he did all of this with very, very bad grace. He would put it the way Toyota wanted, and then he would put it back. And thankfully, he would take notes to know how to put it back for when Toyota came back. So the notes were very interesting. But we were completely confused. And what I discovered yesterday, this confusion is still here. What were they after? After two years of work, 30% productivity on the line. What do you think? Is that good? 30%. Who thinks it's good? Show me. 30% is good? No. 30% on 10% labor cost? That 3% total cost reduction? You can't get this with plain old-fashioned tailors, I and mean, this is not such a big deal. After four years of work, when they renew the product, 30% total cost reduction on the new generation product. That's what they were after. 
They don't really care about the 33%. They get that anyway, just by squeezing the supplier if they want it. That's not at all what we're after. What they were after is learning how to make the product monozukuri through Hichazukuri people development. So that when they make the new product, then, then they win. Think about it. Bleed is just very pragmatic. I don't know how you make it this such a complicated thing. This is what a car looks like. 30,000 parts, modules. This is what like a module looks like. Look at the airbag. Look at the number of people involved with this. So, you want to give more value to customers and cost less? Hey, it's all in the supply network. That's where the value is. So here you have two strategies. You have the usual automotive strategy or the usual business strategy. Just put your foot on the throat of the supplier and squeeze them until they can't do any innovation. They can't do anything else to just give you money. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Or you've got the third approach of saying, let's build value together and then we split the gains, which they did. 30% 30 per, 30 total cost reduction. They split the gain, 15-15 with the supplier. So we all prosper. That's what Lean is about. It's about the product. Let me say this again. It's about the product. Now the question is, how do we do this? Well, in order to do this, and this is, I was a couple of weeks ago in the Toyota Museum in Toyota City, and it's very clear. We have our key components, and we need a learning curve. And this is to show you. You see the learning curve here? You see here the power by weight, the learning curve. Every cycle of product renewal, we need a better product, more value. Less waste. So solely, this is what Lean is about. Change your mind. It's about your product. It's about understanding the key components and understanding that you need a learning curve on each of your key components. So how do you do this? Well, in order to find the opportunities for learning, you put people in a just-in-time logistic supply chain. Back to the trucks, the first plan. Every two hours, you deliver. This puts a rigor on your supply chain that will make the problem surface. These problems are interesting because a part of these problems can turn into engineering solutions, can turn into a better component. Just in time is just a tool. It's a tool to reveal problems so we can look for value. Now, the interesting thing is that you can't do this alone. You have to do it with the people. So the next thing you do, and this is what the whiteboard was about, is you teach everybody to understand the waste so that they can contribute with ideas so that we can have the learning curve, so that we can have more value. It's just technique. And of course, all of this works if you develop the kind of mutual trust that they know that once they contribute ideas and innovation, they will get something out of it. You're not just taking it all, you put it in your pocket. You're spleeing. Pragmatic. So, when I look at you guys, I have four types of people. I have the people I trust and know, and I know they're creative, and when they have an innovation, I say, yeah, yeah, let's, give it, yeah, let's work on this. They bring innovation. Then I have the kind of people that, well, I have the innovative ideas, but when I send them an innovative idea, they say, okay, fine, I see how I can do this, here's a plan, and I'll do it. Then I have the kind of people who are just hardworking and say, okay, I have the innovative ideas, I come up with a plan, and they're really careful in executing it and they make it happen. And then I have the kind of partners that whatever I come up with, they're going to screw it up. Whatever you tell them, you have to micromanage them because they always will find a way to screw it up. And you know what? You know who you are. Each of you knows exactly in which category. You won't admit it, but you know who you are. That what Lean is about. Lean is about selecting the people you can actually co-engineer with. So because we have the guys we need, the only way to do this is to, the basic Toyota thing is that in order to develop the product, and it's very literal, this is not philosophy at all, this is very practical. In order to develop better products, we just have to develop better people. It's just very practical. We just have to understand the chain of thinking that, that gets us there. It's just very pragmatic. So, 
What is leading strategy? Essentially, well, here's the problem. Every day we improve safety, quality, productivity, and variety. Every day. This is what we discussed yesterday. This is what we want to do every day. We want to be aggressive here. There's no way you can do this without the people. You simply can't. So you need to involve the people to think more deeply what, what they do, to have ideas. So this is why the book is called Lead with Respect. Everybody wants to talk to me about respect. Ooh, wouldn't it be nice if the boss was nicer to me? We don't like that. Wouldn't it be nice if we were a friendly environment? Yes, absolutely. But hey, it's lead first. Then respect. So what does lead with respect mean? Lead is showing people where you want to go. Respect is looking at them as individuals, understanding that the obstacles they, find, they face are real. So we listen, and we don't necessarily agree, but we understand that they have their experience, their perspective, that they see things differently than we do, and that the difference is richness, not something to put away. It doesn't change the fact that we're leading, it just change the fact that we look at every, each person as a person as an individual, not as human resources. Ooh. Human resources? What's that even mean? So by studying, we see there is a model. There's, there's a way to do this legal with respect. And it really is a model to support each individual learning curve. And because it's, there is a sort of cultural component about it, you have to see the yin and yang dimension to it. So you're never right, you're never doing this right, but on the one hand, you challenge and you listen. It's not about compromising, you challenge very strongly. I remember one Toyota executive who told me one day his boss gives him the biggest bonus check he ever saw. And the boss says, Pascal San, we expect much, much, much more from you. They were totally confused. No, they were challenging and they were listening. Same thing. Of course you teach. Of course you teach. You teach. But what, just like with your kids, this is what it means teaching. It's like when your kid falls off the bike, then you tell him, never more, darling. That's okay. That's what we do in France. I don't know about Hungary. Of course not. But when they fall off the bike, they still fall off the bike, and you have to on the bike. So you teach, but you support. Again. Never the right balance. Always striving to find the right balance. And of course, and here's a trick. It's by building the teamwork that you learn. So, of course, this is not always easy because not everybody is looking to learn. So we understand now the science is in. We have a lot of studies on this. We have people who have a fixed mindset. They think everything's fixed. The only thing that matters is always look smart, never look stupid. Luckily, most of these guys go into management. <laughs> then we have people who have growth mindset, which is they don't mind making, they don't mind falling off the bike. They don't mind looking stupid because they know they're going to get them anyway. Most of these guys were found in entrepreneurs. They don't care getting it wrong because they'll just get it right next time. So we have middle managers and we have entrepreneurs and we have a bit of a war here. So how do we do this in practice? This is where the tools come in. I hear a lot of nonsense about we've moved in the lean movement. Who has heard this? In the lean movement, we've moved from the two edge to... I don't know what. No, you've not heard this? Who has heard it? Show me. It's not about the tools. Of course it's about the tools. It's always been about the tools. But not the tools to do something to people. The tools to teach people how they solve their own problems. So first tool is always be more aggressive in the value you give to your customers. This is how you distinguish yourself from your competitors. Yes, 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 I know you think your customers are hostages and they won't go anywhere else. Nah. So every day we challenge ourselves through the tool to give more value. Just in time. Just in time is just the biggest, biggest challenge tool. Uh, for, uh, for the lean guys who don't get, have a life, we've been doing this for 15 years. Uh, who has used value stream mapping? 
Oh, God. Go home. Rethink your life. All right. Balance your mapping came from this tool. This tool, who has seen this tool before? Nobody? This is material flow, material and information flow analysis. Okay, the big difference here is that in value stream mapping, you look at only one product, it's really processor engineering. Here, if you look at it, what you have is train times, uh, truck times, and here you have a, a variety of products. Uh, this is a tool about the flexibility in the supply chain. It's a completely different tool. It's not about favorizing one product, it's about how do you have it's about how lead time is created by the rotation between products, which is a real challenge. And everybody uses this, yeah? Who uses this? Show me. Okay, if you don't have this in your factory, you're just simply not doing anything. No? You're probably doing something very good, something very interesting. Probably doing an odd job. But it's not lead. So the key part of just-in-time is translating the customer demand into demand for the factory. So this is very demanding. Then we have Jidoka as a tool, stop and fix. So rather than improve capability, we start by improve the detec detectability. Very demanding. And then you teach everybody to express problems. This is what we do here. We're not solving problems. We're teaching people how to formulate a problem, how to look for a cause. Hours and hours of it. And then we ask ourselves, how are we organize? But when we ask ourselves, it's not about the organizational chart, we ask ourselves, how was this person organized? Which team are they part of? Who's helping them to Kaizen? The teams are just organized for Kaizen. Always look for the next step. So we reduce the box, and then we reduce the box, and then we reduce the box. All of this for the CEO is critical, because when you look at how people solve the challenges you give them, you get new ideas. You intensify the collaboration. Again, back to the value network. And from working on these problems together, you create the kind of trust that builds the real value. So the tools are essential because the tools are the focus point for the problem solving together to create a trust. And remember, this is what we're after. And when we're in a connected world, it's no longer what is the value of one customer. But look at it when you do something wrong. What is the value of the connected world of customers? Where is the platform? George, Nespresso. Nespresso has a machine it sells to you at cost. So it can sell capsules to you for an insane, absurd, obscene margin. Then it sells to you through their database of customers. Then it tracks you by shops that are not designed to sell anything. Where you go because you hope, irrationally, and you know it, that you're going to meet George. <laughs> it's a platform. New age. The product is not one thing. It's the connected elements of the product. So, customer smiles, need we respect. We are every day looking for customer smiles. We're very serious about this. But we know something, they will only come from employee smiles. And here, what you see in the factory is that every Kaizen done by employees themselves is painted green. We do not extract, we do not take their ideas and put it into productivity. We show that their ideas remain their own. And they're happy with this. They own the place as we do. So here's where you need to completely change your mind. We've all been brought up to manage action plans. Do everything at the same time. Everything's fine until every action is to 80%. You never do this, right? And at 80% of everything, everything stops. Because you're pushing all the problems on the plan. So this is what we're told to do. The radical innovation from Toyota is we're now leading learning curves. This means we have to choose which managers hate doing. We have to choose the one thing we need to learn. 
This is learning to learn. What is the important thing to learn? And then we have to ask ourselves, how many times do I need to fall off the bike to finally ride it? Not learning this is not an option. But people are not guilty. We understand they fall off the bike. That's okay, we've got time. This is a radically, completely different way of managing. So when we look at people with respect, we see people as individuals. And then we ask ourselves, each of these persons, each of you here, what is the one learning curve they're on that I need to help them with? What are the difficulties they find? What are the obstacles? And even if these obstacles seem ridiculous, from your point of view, you realize these obstacles are real in their minds. You need to support them. And sometimes support is, sometimes respect is a bit difficult. I remember a very senior Toyota executive saying, my boss, um, respect means really to uh, respect for the autonomy of the person. So sometimes he goes home to his wife and says, oh, darling, I think my boss has shown me a little too much respect today. And this brings me to my first point, is to build this value network, who's on your bus really, really matters. Because your learning is completely dependent on their learning. It's whenever the teams learn from Kaizen that you will learn. They will come up with things you've never thought of. But you need to be open to this. On the other hand, they need to be good, and they need to be smart, and they need to be motivated. Because if not, what they come up, if they do pretend Kaizen, is worthless. I love this photo. This is one of my senseis. He's a 30 years TPS guy in type A plant, and he sent me this photo. The photo is, you know the story of the elephant? The blind man see the elephant. One says it's a snake. The other says it's a tree. The other says it's a wall. No, it's an elephant. This is what we are with TPS. We say, oh, TPS is standardized work. That's part of it. TPS is just in time, it's part of it? No, it's an elephant. So this is, he sent me this photo saying, sensei is being foolish. Keep the open mind. Keep understanding that no matter how we feel we understand everything, we understand nothing. We're still blind men looking at the elephant. So lead with respect. Really, it's back to the definition of what leading is. Kaizen, harder, more respect. Kaizen, harder, more respect. Thank you very much. Szerintem tökény van egy értivára. Mészáros Antonia vagyok, sokan emlékeztek rám, és sokan hiányoltatok biztos ma reggel, úgyhogy rögtön egy hallomással kezdem, ami egyben válasz az első szlágdó kérdésre, valaki megkérdezte, és nagyon szépen köszönöm, hogy hol van Antónia. Az igazság az egyek késztem. Ez egy történelmi pillanat az én életem, hogy soha semmi rendezvényről nem késztem még el, amit én moderáltam, ez ma sikerült, alig, hanem az érettségén buktam el egyébként. Ez az, amit nem kalkuláltam be a reggeli forgalomba. Azt hittem annak idején, amikor átmentem, hogy ezen az akadályon most már túl vagyok. De hát megbuktam, végső soron ezen is. Egyébként, ha már így alakult, bár elsőször nem ez volt a célom, akkor sikerült tesztelni a szabocs probléma megoldó kapességét. Remélem, hogy ez, hogy ez jól is sikerült, úgyhogy a szabocs mindenképpen érdemel majd egy dupla tapsot a végén, hogy ezt is ilyen rendszeretesen jól megoldotta. Én pedig most egy kicsit átváltok angolra, hogy a Michael is ért, értsen, mi történt. I was just apologizing to the audience for being late. That's right, I was making taste uh, on you. Uh, 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 and I was giving you a taste of a delightful language, which I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying. And I was also saying how uh, this was a way of testing Sabocci's ability to solve problems with clear on his feet, and hasn't he done well? Uh, the next, uh, <laughs> Kérdezzünk majd te Látom, hogy vannak már kérdések, ugye az első én válaszoltam meg, a többi remélem neki szól, de azon kívül, hogy vannak kérdések, amiket írtatok, vannak olyan kérdések is, remélem, amiket majd feltesznek személyesen, és hogy ez egy kicsit jobb móka legyen, mint szokott lenni ilyen konferenciákon meg az előző években, van egy úgynevezett dobálós mikrofonunk, ami majd mindjárt elindul a teremben, ezt dobálhatjátok egymásnak is, tehát a következő ember, akire látszik, hogy kérdezni szeretne, ha közelben van, akkor rögtön át is lehet dobni neki ezt a bizonyos mikrofont. 
De majd vissza is lehet dobni a kolléganőmnek, akinél van. Mármint, hogyha megjelenik a kolléganő, akinél van. Ott nem, mert ha a mikrofont már látom, a kolléganő is a szabolcs. Szabolcs, hogy minden tudom. Szóval elindul a dobálós mikrofon, és én tudom, hogy az előző években ti rengeteget kérdeztetek, és nagyon ügyesen. Úgyhogy ne, ne cáfoljatok el erre most sem. Mi elkezdjük most minden esetre azokkal, amik itt vannak. So I was just introducing how to use that microphone, so hopefully there will be lots of questions in the room. But let's start with the ones here. Uh, what does respect mean? Your life goes away a second at a time. Our life goes away a second at a time. The origin of respect terms means understanding that we don't want to waste your time. So the whole wasting is, it's disrespectful to ask yourself, to ask you to do something that is valueless. That's the origin of the term respect. It's not respect as you think. You're very confused because some of the senses will be respectful by yelling at you. How is that possible? Well, you know, they're pushing you out of their comfort zone, and there's no good way to push anybody out of comfort zone. But what they're really pushing you is to understand that you do not do wasteful things. Whether the company asks you to do wasteful things, or whether you are determined to do something wasteful, which happens as well. So respect is really a respect for the fact that everybody's life goes away one second at a time, and every second here should be doing something valuable for yourself, for your company, for society. Ooh. Why do we always use Toyota as the example? What's their secret? Is the next question. That's very simple. Um, <laughs> business models are not infinite. Most of what you've been taught comes from GM, even though GM is almost as weird. But the thinking that we've been taught from America is essentially Taylor, Ford, Sloan, Jack Welch. It's, it's a model. Toyota invented by accident another model because they had less capital and they were in intense competitive pressure. They had reasons. They didn't want any strikes. So they invented another model. Maybe Amazon is a better known model. However, Amazon has used Lean to build its entire supply chain. I know the guy who did it for them. So, so in fact, business models just simply don't come up out of thin air. It's only in books that we can invent a new business model. In reality, there's not that many. So what really happens is that Toyota is just as distinctive today as it was on the day. They have the same volume as a wagon. Well, value this year made zero profit, so it's like 8% net profit, it's just amazing. Um, so this is still interesting today. It's still built on TPS, that's our secret. It's not a secret that it's our secret. The fact that we're all lazy, and we all think we can invent a better mousetrap without having learned the basics of TPS is our problem, not theirs. But I find that Toyota is still as interesting today as it was when I got interested. 25 years ago in it, this hasn't changed. Simply because reality doesn't allow for an infinity of successful business models. So we basically know who they are. So we have business models like GM and Toyota that are built on profitability. Then we have a business model built on, on robbing the bank, like Amazon or Elon Musk. We have no idea if they're profitable because they refinance all the time. So we don't know. And we have mixed business model, such as Apple, that had its ups and downs and is currently investing, is currently taking 0% loans to do share buybacks. So again, we don't know what they're doing. So the advantage of Toyota is that it's very clean. We know they don't do any financial shenanigans because they hate it. We know they're profitable because we have the numbers. And we know, this is the most fascinating and interesting thing for me, that they became number one in a saturated competitive market. Don't think that GM and Ford and Chrysler were idiots. 
They were very smart, very tough competitors. Most of you work for them or have worked for them, so we know how good they were. Still, in that completely saturated market, Toyota managed to grow to be the number one thing in the world. To me, this is incredibly surprising and still as interesting. How, how big a role do you think their lean model had in that? The fact that they were able to have growth their competitive so quickly from nothing. That's an interesting question. All right, so Toyota is a car company, yeah? Nobody knows what they do. They're a car company. They're secretive. They're mean. And they're aggressive. We know they do something different. Then they have, this is this we know, it's what I was telling you about the network of suppliers. Because they do build these trust relationships with them. We know this because we they talk to suppliers. They have to explain to suppliers. So everything we know about TPS doesn't come from what they do inside. It comes from what they explain to their suppliers because they have to convince them to join the just-in-time supply chain. So this we know. Then you have uh, what the idiots like me and others uh, write books about in terms of how we interpret what Toyota tells their suppliers. This is lean. We hope we're right, but as Owen himself says, you know, even a thief is right three times out of ten, so we're probably right five times out of ten. Half of what we say is bullshit. We don't know which half. <laughs> and then you have you. All the companies who are doing really GM but because it's not fashionable, are trying to call their horrible terrorist productivity pressure lean. So they ask us to come and validate by putting the lean stamp on whatever is happening. So we have a continuum. So this is up to each of us to understand where we are in our continuum, and most importantly, which way we turn. Are we turned towards understanding better what Toyota is doing? Or we turn to what's explaining that what we're really doing is really lean. And this is a very individual decision that each of us make every day at work. Now we still have that microphone in the back of the room, which does look like a really good psychic toy, so I would love it if you guys gave it a try. Yeah, come on, uh, We do have questions here on the screen, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask your own here in the room. Um, so if anyone wants to ask a question, just put your hand up, you'll, you'll get the cue, put the microphone's inside, it's almost as if it was inside the little ball, and then you can, you can ask away. Well, oh, come on guys, this feels like Finland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's never like that, so I guess the, the, the cube is intimidating people. Well, well, well it's probably the cube. It's probably it's it's me. It's probably me. No, no, it can't be me. But anyway, I'm, enjoy, I'm enjoying the opportunity to ask questions. And, some people have already done that in writing as well. Okay, we are blind, but we want to know the elephant. How do we start? Do you? Do you? No, you don't. You're just like everybody else. You want to be reassured that the piece of the elephant that you've got is it. Don't you? So this is where you start. You start by understanding you're not smarter or more willful than everybody else. And you force yourself. This is why you can't do lean without sensei. I'm sorry, this is one of the dark secret of wings. You can't do lean without sensei because the moment you've got a piece of the elephant, you run away with it and you think, finally, now I've got, God, I don't need anything else. Or there was a funny question here. Now I've got standardized work. What the hell do you know about standardized work? But now I've got standardized work. So I will apply standardized work for leadership. What? To leadership? How can standardized work apply to leadership? This is complete crap. Absolute bullshit. Hey, you know the difference between bullshit and lying, yes? Bullshit is not untrue. <laughs> it's not me, it's just a bullshit. So, the way you start exploring the elephant is understanding that there's, I'm saying, everybody thinks that they hold the piece of the truth and they need to be reassured by it. That's, that's perfectly human and that's perfectly fine. And then your sensei comes along and says, have you seen this? And you go, no, why? Have you seen this? And you think, oh, fuck, I've missed it. Now, you guys are lucky. Uh, my sense is my father. 
Imagine what it is at my age to work with my father. Imagine what spent six months on the project in the factory with somebody or in engineering. And everybody's very happy with what we've done. And then your father comes in and says, what the fuck did you do? Say, well, we apply the lean principle to you. And he said, yeah, I've noticed this. You know what? Oh, because in this case, it applies completely the other way around. And then you go, oh. All right, tear down everything. That's OK, it's not again. Oh, yeah. Back to this thing. It takes a very, very determined kid to fall off the bike and keep running the bike. If you're not there to do two things. First, to say, OK, I, I know you can't say way of doing this. That's a neat, but fine. And to sh also show you where to go, show you where the next thing is. So again. This is a very deep question. This is a very, very deep question. You can't explore the elephant on your own. So it starts by an act of humility, this understanding that nobody can explore the elephant on their own. Not to that it's not one genius guy who did it all. It's a bunch of guys. Generations of guys all challenging each other, exploring the elephant together. So this is how it works. You need a sensei because the sensei is not there to teach you. The sensei is there to show you things you simply hadn't seen. You're pretty smart when they show you if you want to learn, but you have to want to learn. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting and complex questions that we will not have time for, so we'll tackle them at the end of the day. We'll have another session with you. Maybe one that is short enough and interesting enough. Ooh. All right, it's a big challenge. It has to be short and interesting. I hope you're ready for this. Good morning. Um, great presentation, and I love your style. Um, so I was thinking, what is the thin line, or is there a thin line between uh, leading with respect versus the old-fashioned type of fixed mindset boss type of leading? Is there a thin line? It's a short question, but I need to think about it for a second. It's not easy. It's a great question to ask with zero seconds on the clock. It's <laughs> a <laughs> clock, why do we care? But, but thank, you very, oh, well, thank you very much for fighting. Relax, relax. Relax. Really relax. Really relax. Really relax. Really yeah, really I, 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 know, I know you had a bit of a stressful experience this morning. Relax. <laughs> We're all friends here, it's okay. <laughs> okay, here, here's the thing. Uh, uh, let me try to answer this one. The, the two parts to this answer. First, you never get it right. We have to understand the yin yang nature of this. Um, as the people who were with me in the workshop yesterday understand, I'm always either challenging too much or listening too much. So I mean, that, that's the beauty of it. There is, it, it constantly asks you where you constantly ask you where. You know, uh, I met one of the living gods from Toyota um, when I was in Toyota City, and, and he challenged me to be more patient. One has patience never worked for me, never. And to be more open-minded. So uh, we have a joke now, which I came back with this, and I go, patience, open mind, patience, open mind. There is absolutely no way to get it right. That's the number of it. So you're always challenging yourself in where you are there. The same part of the question, the answer is here. You probably would be surprised to know that I don't think I'm a really good lean guy. Um, I see myself as an artist, not a writer. And here's a trick. And this is why I don't do lean like you do, because when I do lean, I work with CEOs, and our problem is not the factory, it really is product development. And the link between factory and product development. So we, we do lean on the value, added value, and engineering side of lean. And here's a trick to great art. What do you micromanage, and what do you let happen? It's not either or. That's what we are constantly seeking on the shop floor. We need to understand the product and the process in a way that we understand that some things are OK. It, it, it can be not great. So in Toyota terms, this is 80% plus alpha. There's a list of things we just need 80%. It's OK. And there are things we need to plus alpha. Do you see what I mean? So it is not a continuous vision of the product. It's, and this is a mystery. Now, as a writer, as any artist knows, what you micromanage is a mystery. But here's the secret to your question, is looking for 
of an understanding of your product in a way that you understand what it, where 80% is okay. 8 out of 10 is fine. But which are the specific points you're going to have to be really micromanaging and pushing to 9 or 10 or beyond? Right. That, it's a complicated question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I'm also an artist. I'm a musician as well. So oh, well, so you, you see what I mean? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. see you again in the afternoon. Thank you. So,